the materials that I that I that I pointed out in the Google Jamboard, it was probably fairly obvious which is which for CLIL or or ELT. So this one is an example of you know what you might typically find in an English textbook, right? So this is developed based on a, a structured syllabus. Uh, students only learn about vocabulary or or grammar, and the focus is only on the lower order thinking skills. So students don't really need to think too much, right? And nothing new is being learned in terms of of content. Here's an example of of some uh, teacher made materials, right? The teacher, in this case, Reed, uh, made this material. And this, the subject, I guess you could say, is maybe home economics. And the students learn about food groups in a very, uh, what would you say, content-oriented approach. So it's more interactive. Students can can manipulate. They can they can they can, for example, draw or or circle, label, use different colors. And and it's designed to activate and use students' existing knowledge. And students can can not only you know name and categorize the the different food groups, but they're also asked to think about which countries uh, the food the foods are imported from, uh, and how far the food uh, travels to get to you know Japan, for example. Uh, and this is I think this is a good example of declarative versus uh, procedural knowledge. So learning how to use the grammar point uh, come from that's not the aim of, of the lesson but the students need to use that in order to complete the task, right? Uh, students need to think not only about the language that they need, but also about the, the content, how to categorize food into food groups, uh, where food comes from, and, and this can lead into tasks uh, which require the HOTS, the, such as you know, discussion and, and forming opinions, analyzing data, maybe making a presentation, right? Okay, how about adapting textbooks? How can we use CLIL in, in classes which use uh, standardized textbooks? And I know this can sometimes feel like, you know, trying to, to fit the proverbial square peg into the round hole. Um, and I recommend as much as possible, as much as feasible to, to make your own materials. That being said, uh, some textbooks may be more um, appropriate for, for CLIL than others. So recently, we're seeing signs uh, of CLIL in uh, teachers' manuals for, for popular uh, standardized textbooks. Um, here's an example from, from the junior high school uh, New Horizons teacher's manual. Uh, this is for a third year a junior high school. And, and, and you can see it has mention of, of the four C's and uh, Professor uh, Ikeda's CLIL lesson planning sheet we see here. And it even, it even names, name drops CLIL in giving suggestions for, for deepening the content. However, unless CLIL is brought into the lesson with intention uh, and, and an understanding of CLIL theory, it's not likely to be much more than just paying lip service to, to the approach, right? Okay, so how can we, how can we adapt textbooks to, to fit a CLIL approach? Well, well, Matthew Davis ha has some good advice here. He says that it starts with uh, concept mining. So the first way to, uh, of doing this is by paging through the textbook and looking for concepts. And if you find a concept, you ask yourself, uh, does this concept belong to a specific subject? So look at it from the perspective of, of science, of history, of art, uh, geography, uh, maybe one of the social sciences, right? And using this uh, defining technique, the, the textbook material main, mainly aids in the defining or understanding of, of the concept. Uh, the other method uh, to use it, it is to use the text to help uh, demonstrate or, or to deepen the understanding of, of a concept. So using this uh, framing technique, the, the textbook material is mainly used in, in a task where students must apply their, their understanding of the concept. So, and generally speaking, you know, text, textbooks aren't great for, for tasks. They're kind of, you know, task deserts, as you might say, but the content is usually quite good. Um, and it's up to you to find ways to sort of deepen the student's engagement with, with that content. And we do that through tasks. So task design, task design you'll find is the most important and most challenging aspect of, of lesson planning. And this is really where the, the rubber meets the road in CLIL and, and what we're actually making our, our students do in the classroom and how we implement the, the four C's principles. 
And there are many, many different types of, of tasks. Um, these, these are uh, uh, types of tasks that are, are, are well known, I guess you could say maybe, you know, quote unquote, rich tasks, these are, and they're very common in Clil. And all of these tasks focus uh, on meaning, um, on understanding input, uh, on processing, and on producing output. So in general, when we design the tasks we use in, in the lessons, we should, we should build from lots up to hots, building from, from the basic foundation of remembering and understanding all the way up through uh, being able to create something new. <clears throat> and you want to change the, the student's declarative knowledge into procedural knowledge. So the kind of knowledge that, that you can use in, in real life, right? And how do you do that? Well, you have to use it in an in-context communicative situation. And the more you use declarative knowledge in a real life communicative context, the more it changes to procedural knowledge. So all too often, you know, students never move beyond just memorization. So trying to store information for, for use later. Um, and the classroom may not be, you know, one-to-one -one, uh, with a, a real context, but we want to give students in context meaningful language use as much as possible. And this is also related to the idea of transfer appropriate processing. And this is the relationship between how information is initially encoded and how it's later retrieved. Or, or put another way, neurons that fire together, wire together. So students can remember what they learned easily if it's the same situation they learned it in. So for example, um, studying for a test in a classroom works well for taking tests, but not for real world communication, right? And whereas uh, conventional learners only focus on learning uh, the language, CLIL learners should have a more uh, balanced experience. Uh, um, our task design should uh, help support the development of, 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 of general competences. And we should be able to make what are called can-do statements, right? Can-do statements for each of the, the cognitive processes in, in Bloom's taxonomy. And these are the, the concrete skills that, that students can acquire from the task. So again, this starts with the basic cognitive process of remembering, so for example, I can, uh, I can recognize and recall the dates of, of important events in recent American history or understanding. For example, I can, I can write a summary of a video presentation. Applying, I can divide a whole number by another whole number. Analyze, for example, I can recognize uh, the points of view of the author from an article. Evaluate, I can determine if conclusions follow from the data. Um, and finally create, uh, for example, I can, I can create or I can design a, a presentation explaining my research, my own research related to the topic. So there are a few questions we should be asking ourselves when we design tasks for our students. Uh, will the task engage, uh, <clears throat> engage my students' interests? Is there a clear goal or outcome? Will the students know when the task has been completed? And does the task relate to a real world activity? And we should also take note um, of, of aspects of community and cooperative learning for each of our tasks. So a variety of solo, pair, uh, group, and, and whole class tasks will, will help build community in, in the classroom. Additionally, we should strive to use multimodal input. So that includes uh, different types of, of texts, visuals, statistics, uh, and so on. I've listed some, some examples here. And, and this multimodality uh, will add variety to the students' inputs, and some students may learn better or, or more effectively with certain types of, of input over others. Um, in the past, I've used a, a variety of, of different, you know, quote unquote, authentic uh, resources in my own materials, you know, using, using books or, or magazine articles, TED Talks, uh, short films on YouTube. And I found that that students enjoy the variety and, and the periodic change of, of input also helps with, uh, with student engagement. In terms of, of lesson flow, generally we should follow a 4P process for each new concept. So the first P is the pre-task uh, where we activate the student's prior knowledge of the concept. Uh, the next is presentation, where we give the students input about the concept and, and the, the language related to the concept. Third, we have process or, or thinking. 
Uh, this is where students engage in, in the task um, in a pair or, or group work. And finally, production. Uh, students produce something uh, concrete that demonstrates their understanding of, of the concept. And this may not always happen in you know, a, a linear fashion, and there may be a group of concepts rather than just a single concept, but generally this is the pattern that some of our lessons should follow. Um, and uh, to give an example, one, one type of task that often gets used in, in CLIL lessons is called an expert jigsaw reading activity. And, and this, this task is oriented towards uh, learning concepts. So it includes uh, cooperative learning with, uh, with uh, an information gap that's built in. Maybe some of you have heard of this. Um, and you can scaffold the language um, from, from authentic sources as necessary. So, so the setup for this task is fairly simple. First, you start um, by getting students into what are called expert groups, where, where they, they think about the, the concepts presented to them in, in a reading passage. Um, and, and later students get into a jigsaw group where, where the students then share their understanding of, of the concepts that they learned in their expert groups. And essentially the students build um, and then share new, newly learned knowledge in a movement from, from lots to, to hots. So let me, let me show you an, an example. This is from uh, the unit on human happiness that I introduced earlier, talking about, for example, concepts related to consumerism. So this is for expert group A. Uh, and they read this passage that was adapted to fit uh, the student's language level. And then they answer these questions in their expert group. Expert group B gets a, a different passage with uh, different concepts, in this case, uh, consumption and the paradox of choice, and answer the questions. And, and then the same with expert group C, right? Then uh, for the second half uh, of the activity, students are put into jigsaw groups. So one, one of each member of the, the expert group. And in their jigsaw groups, they need to summarize and explain to each other uh, the concepts that they learned, right? So this activity can, can further build on, on HOTS. Uh, for example, if students uh, present their opinion uh, about on the concepts or, or maybe a, a debate as a, a whole class, or they could be assigned uh, homework, uh, for example, you know, writing, um, writing um, an essay and anal analyzing the differences between materialism and, and minimalism. So uh, the expert jigsaw activity in this way can be adapted to, to fit uh, uh, a variety of, of, of different contexts. So, and I hope that gives you, you know, some idea of what CLIL task design can, can look like, but the best way to learn uh, is by looking at other examples. And putting CLIL into practice uh, shows many different types uh, of CLIL tasks. And you can find a textbook specific to Japan and specific to your grade level, everything from, from elementary all the way up to, to university. And I encourage you to um, try uh, to make your own tasks to, to fit the level of, of your students. And, and remember that you know, there's no such thing as uh, the perfect CLIL lesson, and we should never let you know, perfect be the enemy of good. Um, and it's also, I think it's, uh, it's important that you think through your, your support and scaffolding, of course. So scaffolding is very important in CLIL lesson planning and, and the success of your lessons will depend on, on your ability to, to scaffold tasks when, when necessary. So what exactly is meant by, by scaffolding? So let's again uh, get into our breakout rooms and discuss, um, is there a difference between scaffolding and support? Um, do you use scaffolding in, in your lessons? And, and how can we scaffold for students' content and language needs? So again, we'll, we'll do, let's say, 10 minutes for, for this one, and um, I'll have you guys discuss. Okay. This is, a, sorry, John, real quick. Again, this is also available on the Jamboard. If you want to put some ideas up, just scroll to the right. Sure. Okay, thank you. Before we jump into the breakout rooms, apologies for the last breakout room we exited you out because uh, the last the first breakout room was 15 minutes, but the second two breakout rooms would be 10 minutes each. However, Zoom did not let us adjust that setting. So this breakout room will, the timer will say 15, but we'll, we'll actually be going for 10. Um, just, just for 30 seconds or so, I'd uh, like to share with you uh, some of the, the Google Ankit uh, survey forms that uh, 
15, 16 people filled out. I know half of our participants today knew very, um, they knew very little or nothing at all about CLIL. And I think that through Nate's first two um, teaching sec segments, I think that we all can see CLIL is like an umbrella approach. So for those of you that have questions, please keep sending them. But I think in the workshops we are seeing, oh, I've done that before, or oh yeah, scaffolding would be next. And then we hear Nate talk about scaffolding, about task design and so on. So hopefully everyone's feeling comfortable. And without further ado, let's go into our next breakout room session. I'll be opening the rooms now, so you are free to move in. Thank you.